First, we looked at Donna last time. And um, so you heard some of the foundation things that you'll hear mentioned a little bit again here. And that's because I want you to understand that when we're teaching you, um, Bonte worked very hard in putting together over the years. Uh, he, he worked and, and modified it and we finally figured out exactly the suttas he was using and such for these pieces that he teaches. And so each one of the pieces we're teaching you in a way where they're all kind of connected like this and they make a Dhamma cloth. So for anyone who hasn't been here, I think everybody here this time is pretty familiar. So I'm going to be first teaching you from what was written today, and then we're going to go to the document and, and look and see what was in the last version of this to see if we want to talk about any of the other parts, okay? So when you talk about sila, the uh, talking about sila is virtue. It's very interesting because I couldn't find sila. This is funny. I couldn't find precepts in the index in Bhikkhu Bodhi's Majima Nikaya anywhere. I couldn't find precepts. And I kept looking for precepts and I looked for um, uh, morality and I looked under sila and I couldn't find it. And of course, it was a grandmother word to me. Virtue is not something you talked to me about in the 1960s. <laughs> so for me, I hadn't heard this term virtue thrown around all over the place. Now I come to India, I find out people are still using this word virtue. I, I found this kind of interesting. Okay. But talking about Sheila, we're talking about virtue in a different way, through a more complete perspective when we're teaching the Buddha Dhamma. And the um, intermediate, intermediary objectives and the ultimate objective of the Buddhist meditation. So the intermediate objective, what I'm talking about is basically the fact that when you start practicing meditation, if you're following tranquil wisdom insight meditation, you begin to understand fairly quickly, this is the real deal. and You're going to experience um, some good stuff and you're going to start letting go of some of the suffering that you've had for a long time simply because you understand, you all of a sudden understand um, how suffering is working because we're teaching you that along with everything that you're learning. So in review, when we study um, in, and practice TWIM, we find out first, it's mentioned that we must refine and we must retune some of the Buddhist terminology so that it fits together better to reach all of the goals people have in Buddhist practice. This seems to be one of the problems that's happening today with uh, what's happened with the modern idea, a modern period in history, very complex, very digital, very you know, very different from when I grew up and and went even into through college and started traveling and everything. Things were not like this. But today, one of the biggest things with the sterilized version of Buddhist uh, meditation, which I call the mindfulness movement in the world, they only touch the tip of the iceberg is the expression. You have a great big iceberg like the frame here and we only touch this corner, this much of it. We're only using the meditation for to relieve stress, to work more comfortably at the office, to have better relationships at home. It's very sterilized. It isn't anything really to do with the original purpose and everything that was happening with the Buddhist teaching and the meditation part of it. So what we had to do, what 
we were, we're doing the first 10 years I was working with Bonte literally, uh, always tossing back and forth and talking about what's working with the students. What did you see? What did I see in a retreat? And which places did you see people get caught? And I, I would sit where I could watch the students' faces when he was teaching mostly. And, and, and then after I started training to teach, I would sit in the back and I would watch him teach them instead. But in the beginning, for many years, I was always sitting like beside him on the side where I was able to watch your faces as we used information to teach you. And I could tell when someone was not getting something when this started happening or this, or they're trying to write something down and they're perplexed with the way that we're saying things. And that's how come words got changed. Uh, but words did not get changed in a sudden irresponsible way or because we wanted to make it sound like the way we were going to teach it to you. It wasn't like that. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we ended up with, uh, you know, I keep one of them with me, this little guy here, the Oxford thesaurus, the compact Oxford thesaurus with 450,000 words in it. But actually, Bonte prefers five of them for us to consult if he's ever going to change any word when he's teaching you. I want you all to know that because we have to look at the word that means the same thing, but it's going to work for you. And so the quickest example of showing you what was going on in the development of teaching TWIM was to say um, applied and sustained thought in the instructions for the breathing meditation. He talks about applied and sustained thoughts in the first jhana, but nobody understood that. And everybody was applied and sustained thoughts? What's that? And finally, when we examined all of the synonyms regarding this, we began to say something different, thinking and examining thoughts. Ah, thinking, a thought comes up and examining expands it. We were talking about Vitaka and Vichara in Pali. That's what turns out we were talking about. We didn't know that at the time, but that's what it was. Vitaka is when the thought comes up, but when you start to massage it and make it more, it's almost like looking at um, what happens with craving link and uh and then clinging link, how it expands, same sort of thing. So that's what happened. So that's why some of these words are different. So you've heard me say before, um, before this section, you've heard me mention a little sutta that is Anguttara Nikaya number three, book of threes, section 125. And it's a statement of the Buddha that I particularly like because it refers to the fact that, well, he found the big tamale. <laughs> that's, that's the way we would say it. He found the answer. And he mentions it here that he did. And there's another place in um, 148, the Chachaka Sutta, where he also mentions he found the escape. And he's not referring just to one big experience of Nibbana, and that's it. That's not the way this is all working. Um, so this is a statement of the Buddha referring to his search in the suffering. And he tells the people, he tells the monks and the people, I do not teach a Dhamma without a basis. I teach a Dhamma without knowledge. I do not teach a Dhamma that is antidotal, means it doesn't have an antidote for the disease, the suffering. And then it says, I teach a Dhamma with a basis. I teach a Dhamma with knowledge. I teach a Dhamma with an antidote. This is key. 
he found what he was looking for. That's what's real important. So in number one, we said, I do not teach the Dhamma without a basis. It refers to the foundation teaching that we are asking you to listen to, repeatedly read it over and listen to it again. And write down, write it down when you listen to it in the old retreats in the first night when he teaches this foundation pieces. Comprehend it in your own writing. Read it again and again. Reflect deeply on it and then try sharing it one-on-one -on -one with someone else. Don't jump in, decide, I'm going to teach people. It's not time. It's not time because you won't have a lot of answers. And if you wanna be a teacher, if that's why you're trying to teach too early, okay? Um, you're gonna be saying things and trying to come up with answers because you don't wanna sound like you don't have an answer and you're gonna give them answers that will confuse things. That's what's really tough. And that's what you don't wanna have start happening and you have to back up a whole lot. And we're, you know, the big thing is we're here. And if anybody wants to start to go to teach people, we did figure out some frameworks for this. We do have ways of helping you if you will connect, if you will ask when you have problems or difficulties. I ran into this, what's the best way? What's the best thing to do? That's what we want to hear, that kind of, of interaction with learning this in order to teach it, because it's very sensitive. The basis or the foundation comes, the information that you get uh, directly out of the suttas. And over the years, uh, it has been boiled down to eight little topics. You've heard me probably say this before, eight little topics interwoven together and finally tested by students over a period of 25 plus years in hundreds of retreats. And it was boiled down to these eight supportive topics for a specific reason, because then it all comes together. But teaching them as isolated topics didn't help anybody, didn't make it so people would easily discover there really was an escape. These eight topics appear to be uh, in a causally related line of connection, and they reveal the necessity for clear understanding and practical use by the meditator to stay on track in a 10-day minimum retreat. Now, 10 days is minimum, Really, we tried seven and was kind of frustrating because we saw people just sitting, you know, sitting on the edge like this, and we wanted them to go like that, and we couldn't do it. In seven days, we couldn't do it. There was always a glitch. Ten days, they would have gone right over and kept going, you see, and we could both tell what was happening. Okay, guides are supposed to catch this is what a guide really is. A guide is somebody who is supposed to catch when a person falls off the track, this track of these eight things as, as you're learning about them and having them happen, and, and explain how to get up back on the track and rebalance again. Prior to the eight topics, we are shown a set of interconnected vocabulary that prepares us to understand each topic as it is taught. Now, this is cool information I'm telling you because this basis or foundation is necessary to reach the conclusion of the sutta which you listen to. And it is the, it is the, um, the discovery of the antidote for the suffering is what you're always looking for in every single sutra. There's a piece of it that's telling you about this, but they're not a bunch of isolated pieces sitting around that somebody decided each one was important enough. We should save them. So we'll put them in a book. It's not quite like that. Amongst the foundation terminology that we find the connection between, now listen carefully, you've heard these before, but I want to make sure that you have them. There's a direct 
connection and correlation that operates in the machine. It won't run right, so to speak, if you don't understand the meditation piece and the mindfulness piece. So the meditation, you know what it is. It is the steps of the, uh, the right effort. And I like to say now it's, hey, teach your brain to say when something comes up to pull you away from whatever your object is, never mind, just never mind. Let go, relax, smile, and come back and stay with your object of meditation. And sometimes when you are an advanced student, and we need to, I think we need to be starting to have some advanced meditation classes because the advanced meditators have different things they're looking at than the beginners and people just starting out. And they need to be able to ask the questions in front of the other ones that are basically more advanced. And you're gonna hear and learn from each question from everybody, you need to be doing this. But the meditation, the mindfulness is actually the observation skill, okay? And the meditation is you are observing, specifically observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, and the Three Characteristics. That's the discovery. And those, those are subjects that are part of the rest of the subjects that will make total sense to you. Nothing that is taught to you should be taught to you in a way that you don't see how you can use it in life. And I think TWIM is wonderful because I hear horror stories about someone practicing for 15 or 20 years and not understanding how things were connected. It's like it's scattered all over. And to me, that's a shame. And I don't think the teachers know they're doing this to you. And I don't think it's done intentionally. But that's what's coming out sometimes is exhausted people who cannot see how this is all connected. Then another chunk you ha have to remember and you have to write down the definitions and just keep looking at this part be between a, the relationship between the six sense doors and contact feeling and craving. There are a lot of suttas in the texts that are only bringing you to craving. That's all the farther you go with the, with the, um, you know, with dependent origination, just that far. And you see, you don't even know that as a beginner, when you come to us, you're presented with the six sense doors, contact, feeling, and craving so that you can understand how feeling happens and how suffering occurs but you don't even know we're teaching you dependent origination from the first day. It's crazy. I didn't. And, uh, but within a one retreat, people realized, gee, he was talking about that the first day by the fifth day. They know he was talking about that on the first day when he gave the instructions. Look at that. He gave us that. The next one is the Sheila. And this is the subject tonight is Sheila, but to learn Sheila in direct connection to the Niwarana. And that is the distractions or the hindrances. The Niwarana and the Sheila needed to be taught side by side. Why? Because when we teach you Sheila, we're giving you an umbrella. <laughs> and when we give you the umbrella, these things are coming down on you all through your life. These hindrances, the five hindrances are coming down on top of you like a shower. If you're keeping your precepts, they just bounce off. These don't even touch you. If you're breaking your precepts, you in the umbrella and letting them in. And what's the problem with the Nawarana? Well, the Nawarna happened to us, but when you understand the whole teaching clearly, you understand they were happening to you in life. They're happening to you in your practice. But the reality is they didn't have to 
be spent any time sitting with them or studying them or stopping working on your object of meditation and seeing them and watching them until they go away or anything like that. This is not a diagnostic meditation we're teaching you. This is one that gives you simple instructions. And if you just do what it says, then you get to go right down the path. And that's the way he designed it. But there's been a lot of perplexity and a lot of complexity and then perplexity that has happened in Buddhist practices because these two are not taught together. Even in Sunday school, I was told to teach Sheila, teach Sheila, teach the Sheila. You don't have to teach the new Warinas. Not until the child is nine or 12 years old and is old enough to then start talking about seriously sitting in meditation. But those children can sit in meditation from the beginning, pretty young. If we have a relationship to understand this way, and the kids oh, are so much smarter than we ever knew them in my lifetime growing up. And I'm 71 and I grew up with children all around me in Sunday school and churches and stuff. And these kids are not today like kids were at all. They're very sharp. They're very quickly able to learn and understand about the hindrances. And when they happen to a person to bother them, you know what are the hindrances? I'm lust and greed is the first one, and hatred and aversion is the second one, and sloth and torpor, feeling sleepy, dull mind. Why do you have a sleepy, dull mind at school? Oh, I was mean to my sister last night, really mean to my sister, and I feel so bad about it, so guilty. I can't even do anything in my nursery school today. They know what this stuff is. If you teach them from the beginning, they're going to understand it. But if you had said you were sorry and please forgive me, if that had gone on and you had let go of this or told mom or dad and talked to them about it, it wouldn't be hanging over you and bothering you in school. And that's what sloth and torpor is. Then you have restlessness, guilt, and remorse because when she goes to lunch, the little girl can't, or the little boy can't stop moving and just bouncing around in the, in the lunchroom. If you've been in kindergarten and first grade classes, you, you know what I mean. They can't sit still. All right. So the next one is mental pain and physical pain and learning from the beginning there is such a thing as mental pain and physical pain, and that you can let these things uh, go by keeping your Sheila has a lot to do with that. Your mental pain can come from past lifetimes trickling in. Oh, how can it do that, Sister Kama? Well, because if we pass away, the energy of what we did in this life, in the conscious energy, is sort of like floating in a pool and comes into someone else. And some, when it comes in, if there was a carryover in the line of that and you got some of it in the next life, it might creep in at any age it can happen to you. When you're young, it can say, oh boy, here's something for you. You can't touch a horse. You can't ride a horse. You can't even touch one. Why? You have no idea. Or why are you afraid to learn to go in the water and learn to swim? Or why are you terrified of something with wheels? Why? And these things, these phobias that happen to uh, people when they grow up and can come as late as in their 50s or 60s, mostly not much later, maybe than 50s, but it can happen up to 50, 55 years old. A phobia that you don't know why you're afraid of something, that's from the past. Coming in from something else to burn off, be confronted with in this particular lifeline. So we seem to uncover relationship difficulties between uh, words that were used in translations of instructions uh, that worked. And, and then we get caught up when we're wanting to teach someone else about this. We get caught up with our wishes to be unique. And inadvertently, we change what Bonte found. 
And the thing about what Bonte found about the about the teaching, the thing about it was that it was pretty delicate. It's like a delicate kind of recipe. Yeah, like a delicate kind of recipe.